Hello and welcome to the AIM Summit webinar. I've been extremely excited about this session and I hope you are as well. Uh, this is the topic of short and medium term outlook for the global economy and an anemic U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped strong recovery or a W-shaped double dip recession. Uh, this session has been sponsored by Equity Group and is uh, our, our guest today is Noriel Rubini, none other. Uh, he's a professor of economics in New York University's prestigious Stern School of Business, as well as chairman of macroeconomic consultancy firm Rubini Macro Associates. He's widely known around the globe as one of the most passionate and outspoken economists who forewarned of the impending 2008 subprime mortgage crisis and collapse. He served as a senior economic advisor to the White House and U.S. Treasury and is a graduate of Bocconi University in Milan. He went on to receive his doctorate in economics at Harvard University and later served on the faculty of Yale University's Department of Economics. Joining us for this session today are nearly a thousand participants from over 75 different countries around the world. Uh, looking at the audience, it is composed of institutional investors, family offices, high net worth individuals, leaders of the financial industry, managing over a trillion dollars globally in assets. Uh, the keynote following Nouriel's session will have a Q&A session. We encourage everyone in the audience, please put in your questions, put them in as they come. We'll be monitoring the Q&A. Unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have time to be able to get to all of the questions, but we will get to as many as we can. So please, again, feel free to ask your questions as they come. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the webinar sponsor. Without them, this session would not have been possible. That is Equity Group. They are a pioneering fintech firm and world-class provider of online trading technology and multi-asset financial products. The group is, globally, is a globally regulated brokerage with six financial licenses, including FCA in the UK, ESCA in the UAE, and offers a range of uh, top range of global equities, indices, commodities, precious metals, and FX. Um, before introducing Noriel, um, I would like to briefly introduce uh, Mr. Iskandar Najjar, the CEO of Equity Group, who will be also giving you a welcome to the session. Thank you very much, Iskandar. Great Equity Group to sponsor this AIM Summit and bring Professor Rubini to address you all this afternoon. This session can come at a more dramatic time for global markets. The pandemic has caused enormous volatility across almost every asset class, and Equity Group alone saw monthly record trading volumes exceeding 100 billion during H1 of this year. Looking forward, we are not out of the woods yet, as uncertainty over a second wave and the political situation in the US seems likely to dominate the picture as we move towards the end of the year. And the long-run impacts of COVID are only beginning to make themselves known. There's a lot to think, talk about and to think about, so we're fortunate and grateful to have Professor Rubini on hand to discuss what we expect for the global economy in the short and medium term. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite him to share his thoughts on the risks and opportunities that this unprecedented environment offers investors. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor being with you folks uh, from all over the world uh, today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would like to give you a bit of a perspective on how I see the outlook for the global economy, given this uh, very severe COVID uh, crisis. We know that this has been the deepest recession that the global economy has had since uh, World War II. Uh, was worse even than the recession that we had uh, during the global financial crisis of a decade ago. That's why I called it the, the greater recession because it was a more severe recession than the GFC. And of course, it was a synchronized global recession because uh, it was uh, a recession driven by a policy-induced coma, first in uh, China and Asia, then Europe, then the US, and all over emerging market. We had to lock down and shut down a large part of economic activity as a way of trying to control the spread of the contagion of the virus and flatten the curve. Uh, that's the bad news. Uh, the relatively good news is that while this has been the most severe recession that the world has experienced since World War II, this has been also the shortest recession. It lasted on average about uh, four months, so February, March, April, and May. And we've seen the beginning of a recovery of economic activity in most parts of the world uh, uh, for two reasons. One, that after we controlled in part uh, the spread of the contagion, we are able to reopen economic activity. 
And secondly, there has been a massive uh, policy stimulus, monetary, fiscal, credit, and otherwise, especially in advanced economies, but also in some emerging markets. Now, in the first half of the year, Q1 and Q2, there was literally like a free fall of economic activity. And therefore, when we look at the data for the third quarter of this year, the one that we are right now, it looks like this is a beginning of what is a V-shaped recovery. But the V-shaped recovery, when you have a free fall, is easy because there was such a collapse of demand, supply, employment, that uh, as soon as we have phased out the lockdown and we have restart economic activity, for a few months, uh, growth may look like a V. The question is not about the third quarter, but what will happen next? Are we going to have a continuation of this strong uh, V-shaped recovery? Or are we going to move towards a more anemic uh, U-shaped recovery with a more gradual return to growth? Are we going to have the risk of a W, a double deep recession? And what's even the risk of having over a medium term uh, something like a stagnation, if not a near depression? Now, the data are mixed. As I pointed out, there has been a, a recovery of growth in the third quarter, but recently there has been a stall of that growth, for example, in the United States, where growth is uh, slowing down. Slowing down because in the sun belt of the United States, south and west, but now also in the, in the Midwest, there's been a pickup in cases, sharp increase, given the botch had the response to the crisis. Uh, there is a possibility, of course, of a second wave in the fall, in the winter. In the U.S., we have a risk of a fiscal cliff if we don't have an agreement on a new fiscal stimulus. Uh, there is a wide range of U.S. electoral uncertainties, and I'm going to discuss them. There may be a risk of a rise in business and corporate bankruptcies. While the labor market is improving, there is still very high unemployment rate. Uh, there is still a huge amount of uncertainty and risk aversion that is bearing on the business decision, both of the private sector, corporates, businesses, and households. And as I'll point out, there is also some deleveraging of the private sector, especially the corporate and households. And there's even a risk of a gradual credit crunch by the banks. If you look even at Europe, the data suggests that after the beginning of a recovery, now that recovery is also weakening. For example, if you're looking at the forward-looking PMI data from Europe. Why? We've had a second wave of new cases, given the reopening of occurred too fast. There may be a rise in the fall in unemployment rate as the, the temporary furloughs are ending. The risk of a third wave, of course, in the winter. There has been an appreciation of the euro relative to the dollar that is weakening, and that may hurt the competitiveness of Europe and the Eurozone, that is a relatively open part of the world running current account surpluses. Uh, there is the burden of high level of private and public debt. And of course, there is even the risk of a potentially hard Brexit as the negotiation between uh, Europe and the UK are not going in the right direction and then may have negative impact both for the United Kingdom and for Europe. The data also suggests that there are economic fragility and slowdown in many emerging markets. There is still a widening of the spread of the contagion in a number of these emerging markets. These emerging markets have limited policy space, both in terms of their ability to do monetary and fiscal stimulus, and of course, they have more constrained and weaker healthcare system than in advanced economies. There are many other also macro and financial fragilities in a number of emerging markets. The existence of a dollar debt, the fact there has been a shock to oil and commodity prices. There has been a shock, of course, to tourism, and many of these emerging markets have a lot of revenue from tourism. There has been a shock to remittances for countries that receive remittances from their workers living and working in Europe, in US, in Asia, or in the Gulf. And of course, there is high rise in unemployment and underemployment. Of course, some emerging markets, especially those in Asia, are better off, they're stronger macro fundamental, they have economic and financial links to China that is recovering uh, better. So if you look at the data for the third quarter, the data are mixed. Some measure of demand and supply for the third quarter have improved, of course, significantly since the second quarter. 
but some of the high frequency data suggests there is uh, some of the stall of growth in the third quarter. Q3 may look like a V with growth rate annualized 20-25%, but even 25% annualized means just within the quarter a growth of 5%. When you annualize it, it becomes 20-25%. Uh, but the fourth quarter may likely to be more like a U. We have an annual, annualized rate of growth of only 4 to 5 to 6%. So the risk is, of course, is that the V, current V, may be turning into an anemic U, and a U could turn into a w, w, w double dip if there is a second wave in the fall and we don't find the vaccine in time. Now, the perspective about uh, the contagion and the vaccine are a mixed bag. The cases are still high in some parts of the United States, Sun Belt and Midwest, in some parts of Europe, like in Spain, Greece, France, where they're rising from low level. Uh, they're rising also in places like Australia and Japan, where now in Australia we have in the Southern Hemisphere the beginning of a fall and a winter. And of course, still high cases in many emerging markets like India, Brazil, parts of Latin America, Russia, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the optimistic case is that if we have more social isolation, if we use more masks, if we have more test tracing, and if we avoid the risky activities like indoor activities, then over time the number of cases may fall without having new full lockdown that have a lot of economic pain. This is the optimistic view, and indeed in some parts of the US, now the cases are starting to fall as well as in other parts of the world. However, some people have suggested that only a full lockdown, meaning a sheltering place for everybody but essential workers, is necessary for up to six weeks in order to really crack down on the spread of the contagion. For example, the president of the Minneapolis Fed in the United States, Neil Kashkari, said we need another full lockdown, otherwise the number of cases is going to remain high. But of course, the political will to do another lockdown is not there, given that the lockdowns have had to a very severe impact of economic activity. Of course, there is a question of whether there is going to be a second wave in the fall in the winter and how severe it's going to be. The second wave may emerge in the fall in the winter uh, before a vaccine is found. And how severe this second wave is going to be depends on how much we do control and crack down on the current first wave. We know that the virus spreads more in cold weather, like the virus flu and the cold, also because people have to spend more time indoors and the risk of spread of the contagion when you're indoors is higher. And the data, for example, from Australia, where now the fall and the winter are starting, shows that the cold weather can lead to a spike. So my, one can certainly expect that the second wave in the fall and the winter in the northern hemisphere is going to be, but most likely less severe than we've had it in the previous episode. Now, what's the outlook for vaccines and for other treatment? Here there are some good news. There are at least uh, six candidate vaccines that are in phase three, some developed in US, in Europe, in China, in Russia and other parts of the world. And there are two scenarios. Scenario number one is the vaccine is ready before the end of this year and is producing mass in the early part of next year. So many people get vaccinated in the first half of next year. The second scenario is one in which the vaccine would not be ready until the middle of 2021 at the earliest. Now, even in the first scenario, uh, there are plenty of questions. Are we gonna be able to produce enough vaccine to immunize most people around the world? Will the vaccine be truly safe and effective? How many doses will be required? Will it prevent the disease or make it milder? And what's the political economy of vaccines globally, as many countries are gonna to race to be the first one to use it and administer it only to their own citizens? So there is uncertainty in all of these questions. Now, in the optimistic scenario, as I pointed out, a vaccine is ready by November, December. Most people get humanized by the middle of 2021, and that certainly is going to improve the growth prospects in 2021. In the second scenario, instead, there are downside scenarios of economic recovery because the V-shaped recovery in the third quarter could become a U, 
and there is even a risk of a double dip W uh, if a second wave is severe before we have found that, that vaccine. So that's the risk that we're facing. Now, in terms of the shape of this economic uh, recovery, uh, I've talked about whether it's a V or a U or a W or whatever. Certainly this crisis looks like also a K shape recovery, K. K because the winners are better off and moving up. Those who have jobs, like good jobs and white collar jobs, and those who have financial wealth, and now stock prices have recovered from the lows of March, and they're reaching new highs. While the losers, those that are left behind, are in trouble. They've lost income, they've lost jobs, and many of the poorer people are having less financial wealth. So those who are better off are doing better, and those that are worse off are doing worse. In that sense, people are now talking about a K-shaped recovery. And indeed, in the US and around the world, there is a bit of a divergence between Main Street that represents workers, households, and small businesses, and Wall Street that represents big businesses, big tech, and big banks. The stock markets around the world have recovered most of the losses, in some cases like the US, have reached a new high. Uh, but now there is a risk that we are into a bubble territory. And of course, a new correction may have started. Uh, last week, of course, we saw the fall of a number of tech stocks. And even this morning, the futures market showed that the Nasdaq might have another two or three percent at the opening. And in my view, the risk is that Main Street is still in this severe distress and a U-shaped recovery is more likely than a strong recovery like a V. Why do I think that the U-shaped recovery overall is more likely than a V-shaped recovery? Before the crisis, we know that there were many firms in US, but also in many other parts of the world, that were highly leveraged. In the US, you had the build-up of CLOs, leveraged loans, high-grade, high-yield, fallen angels, trillions of dollars of debt. And now many of these highly leveraged firms are under some degree of financial distress and they're risking even uh, financial bankruptcy. So to avoid bankruptcy, what do we have to do? They have to spend less, they have to save more, and they have to do less investment, less capital spending. But if they're spending less, what's their main cost? Their labor cost. But my labor costs are somebody else's <coughs> labor income and consumption. So as firms have been shedding costs, labor income has weakened, and that has forced also the rest of the private sector, households, to spend less and save more, and of course to do less spending on investment, real estate, in spite of mortgage rates being low, credit scores are worsening. So the private sector is deleveraging both the corporate sector and the household sector. And in the US, there is even the risk of a tsunami of evictions and foreclosures for renters and homeowners. So the household saving rates have gone up from 8 to 20%. As households are uncertain, risk averse, worried about their jobs, their incomes, and their future. Same thing is happening in the corporate sector. Many small enterprises are going out of business, small retail stalls, small businesses. And for every job that is created, say, by Amazon, there are 10 jobs that are lost uh, in the retail sector. So if you think about this division between Wall Street and Main Street, Wall Street is going up because they're squeezing labor costs and achieving the earnings target, but that hurts Main Street workers and households. And many small businesses are going out of business, but many of these small businesses are creating most of the jobs while the market share of the large businesses is going higher. So while the stock market until recently is doing well, that's not a reflection that the real economy is doing well. If anything, many parts of the real economy is suffering, households, workers, and small businesses. The other risk we're facing is the following one. Many firms are shedding jobs and they're starting to hire, but instead of hiring workers full-time with full-time jobs that have full wages, good wages, good benefits, they're instead rehiring workers 
in a more precarious way. Part-time workers, hourly workers, temporary workers, gig workers, freelancers, contractors. That's what happened after the global financial crisis. And since firms prefer that flexibility, we're going to see the same thing again this time around. So even if we're creating many jobs and the employment number in the US suggests, say, last month, 1.4 million, the quality of these jobs is not the same as before. And that uncertainty and risk aversion is going to bear down on labor income and the recovery of consumption. So bankruptcy risk for highly leveraged firms are rising. Uh, there is going to be a rise in non-performing loans in the banking system as many households, small businesses, and even real estate firms may default, and that's going to increase the non-performing loans. The banks now have capital, they have less leverage, they have liquidity, they're not going to go bust, but they may become more cautious. And if they become more cautious, then there could be a credit crunch. Now, what's happening on the macroeconomic outlook? Uh, this is some good news. There has been massive monetary, fiscal, and credit stimulus. Monetary policy in advanced economy is still very easy. Zero policy rates, negative policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing, forward guidance. Uh, credit policy also becoming very easy, helping parts of the corporate sector. And uh, central banks are even buying corporate bonds, high grade and even fallen angels. And is of course helping illiquid but solvent firms. Fiscal policy is also overall easy in most advanced economies, including more risk sharing in the Eurozone. But of course, now there is a risk of a fiscal cliff in the United States. Of course, in the short run, if the public sector, uh, if the private sector saves more and does less capital spending and investment, the public sector has to dissave and run budget deficit and spend more on public investment in order to make sure that economic activity recovers rather there is a contraction. However, there are question marks on how we're going to manage over time this buildup of private and pub private debts. Currently, low, uh, there are low debt servicing ratios for now because interest rates on the short and long end are low, but this uh, buildup of debts, private and public, is a time bomb, especially if growth of jobs and income is not going to resume robustly. The Institute for International Finance says the global debt globally is already last year 322% of GDP. This year may go to 345. And the other question is, the central banks are building up with QE their balance sheets, but are they going to exit QE and run down their balance sheets? Now, in the short run, of course, there is a very little risk of inflation because we have a slack in goods market, in labor markets, in commodity and real estate. So there is, if anything, the risk of deflation and loflation. But over time, if we're going to monetize large budget deficits, that may lead over time in the next couple of years to inflation or even stagflation if you have negative supply shocks like deglobalization. Remember the 1970s when we had two oil shocks in 73 and 79, we monetized fiscal deficit, we ended up with recession, inflation, stagflation, and that's the risk two years down the line. And of course, gold prices and the rise in inflation expectation are starting to price in the risk that central banks around the world are debasing fiat currencies, and that's a risk. Now, if you look at the United States, I would say there are four political and electoral risks that you have to be aware of. First one, the risk of a fiscal drag. If Democrats and Republicans don't reach an agreement on a new fiscal relief plan, it is necessary because the economy is weak. Secondly, intelligence sources suggest that foreign powers like Russia, China, Iran are interfering with US election to create political chaos and undermine the legitimacy of this election and weaken the US from within. Three, there is a risk of political chaos after election as uh, both sides may argue that the election was rigged. You could have court litigation continuing for weeks, if not months, if the results of the election are very narrow, and both sides may argue that the other side rigged the election. You could even have civil unrest, if not violence, in the streets. This is a significant amount of uncertainty. Unfortunately, 
this is going to be the ugliest election we have had in decades in the United States. And this political noise may bear on the market. Now, some people are worried that if Biden is elected, and if the Democrats are going to have a sweep in the Senate, that's still an if, but this is in the curve, that this might have a negative impact on the markets, equity markets, because he has already expected to increase taxes on the corporate sector and on the wealthy. However, I think that the results might be different for the market, might be more positive, because his policies are going to be pro-growth, more infrastructure spending, more investments on green economy, more minimum wages and higher labor income for workers, more proactive fiscal policy, less trade frictions, less maybe geopolitical frictions, less use of Twitter to create a market noise, and that on net may create more growth, may create more jobs, and would also improve the market. Another risk, of course, that we're facing today is that there is a recent escalation of the Cold War between US and China, and this Cold War could become a colder war. There have been a number of hawkish speeches by US officials, including one by Secretary of State Pompeo, accusing the Chinese Communist Party of being a threat to the US. There have been a closing of reciprocal consulates. There has been a Chinese crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong with the postponement of local election. And the US has retaliated with legislation against Hong Kong in sanction of Chinese and Hong Kong authorities. There are rising tensions on Taiwan and the South China Sea as now the U.S. formally challenges the U.S. claims on these water and islands. And of course, the trade, tech, finance, and investment war between U.S. and China is escalating. The Huawei ban has been extended and spread to other Chinese tech firms. There is the ban on TikTok and WeChat. There is a possible delisting of Chinese firms that do not follow U.S. standards for audits. Now, this tension is driven both by cyclical electoral factors and more structural strategic ones. The cyclical factors are that Trump is currently behind the polls and of course he has to look tough on China as to back up his own political support. The structural and strategic ones are that there is a rising to city distrust and a rising rivalry between a rising power China and existing power of the United States and this is an escalation of the rivalry on who's gonna be controlling the key industries of the future. AI, robotic, automation, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicle, biotech, and so on and so on. And even the, the phase one deal of trade agreement between US and China could, could unravel if uh, Trump remains uh, weak in the poll. Now, even a Biden's presidency may not be able to have a more constructive relation with China is now there is a bipartisan consensus that the rise of China is a potential threat economically and to the national security of the United States. So globally, what we have to worry is about a decoupling between US and China, a balkanization of the global economy. We have a global balkanization of global supply chain, more import protecting uh, policies, of uh, import substitution industrialization and every country trying to protect their own workers and firms, fragmentation of the global economy, reshoring of economic activity and less FDI towards China, Asia and emerging market, and the risk of deglobalization that will be reducing potential growth and increasing costs. That's a rising risk. So that's something we have to worry about. Uh, let me conclude with some observation for some financial market. Until recently, there was a very strong rally in some equity markets, especially in the United States, where the drop recovered and we reached new high, both for the S&P 500 and for the NASDAQ. And the rally, of course, was the strongest in the tech sector, in biotech, in the growth segments of the market. Of course, S&P 500 having a lot of weight in pharma, biotech, technology, communication services, and NASDAQ. Other indices were doing less well. And of course, part of the rally was driven by many of these young traders joining the market, the supposedly Robin Hood traders, pushing higher to fraughty level the uh, devaluation of firms like Tesla, Biotech, 
in vaccine firms. Now there has been the beginning of a correction, especially of those tech firms. And the question is this going to be a minor correction, is going to be a more severe correction, or a beginning of something more severe. Now, the positive that remain for the equity markets are several. First of all, we still have very, very easy monetary policy and the new Fed strategy of a flexible average inflation targeting implies that the Fed is going to stay lower for longer and the timeline on when they're going to stop doing QE, when they're going to stop uh, having, staying at zero and then moving away is pushed into later, maybe 2024, even 2025. So that's good news. And while we have a risk of a fiscal cliff, we also have a situation in which both parties need a fiscal stimulus. Otherwise, their own base is going to be damaged. And therefore, the possibility of a deal on fiscal stimulus is going to help the economy is still there. Secondly, as pointed out, market know that you cannot fight the Fed and you should not fight the Fed with the Fed being so accommodative. And until now, uh, bond yields have been very low and therefore the return from holding bonds has been close to zero on the short end, 60 basis points on the long end in US. So people say, Tina, there is not really an alternative to stocks. Uh, there's been a beginning of a tentative global economic recovery and stock markets are forward looking. And of course, until recently, we were in risk on and positive animal spirits that were boosting the markets. And of course, there is a hope and not just a hope, that out of those six uh, vaccine trials, some of them are going to be safe and effective. They're going to come soon and we get immunized and economic activity can pick up next year. What are, however, the potential negatives on the equity market? Price earning ratios are very high based on many measures, including the Schiller cyclic adjusted P ratio. There is fraughtiness, if not a bubble, in a number of markets and sectors especially tech and biotech. The US is still at risk of a fiscal cliff. We have a potential of a shock to bond yields if eventually inflation were to pick up. As I pointed out, there are a number of geopolitical risks, not just between US and China, but also between US and Russia. And of course, there is a number of geopolitical risks I don't have to discuss right now in the Middle East. Uh, there is, the, as I pointed out, at least policy and political risk in the United States. And there has been fraughtiness and this uh, bubble of fraughtiness now is starting to correct. Of course, if I'm right that there's going to be a U-shaped recovery of growth, then you're going to have also a U-shaped recovery of profits. And if you have a U-shaped recovery of profits rather than a V-shaped recovery of the economy and profits, then even if in the short run markets can be lifted by liquidity, the forces of gravity of a U-shaped recovery of the economy, of growth, of jobs, of profits and earnings imply that then there could be a correction. In March, with the markets down 30-40%, there was a clear asymmetry. Markets could go higher with strong monetary and fiscal stimulus rather than going lower. Today that they've recovered the losses and reached even new high, there is more of an asymmetry. The upside is lower and the downsides are there. So while you don't want to be significantly underweight, maybe this is the time to buy some protection against the risk of a correction, especially in the parts of the market that are slightly overvalued. Okay, I will stop here and I'm happy now to have uh, answers to some of the questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nouriel, so much. You uh, really covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in through the live Q&A. Uh, we won't have time to address all of the questions, but what we will be doing is trying to combine some of your questions uh, and, and uh, addressing as many as we can. I'll be joined on this Q&A session 
by Gaurav Kashyap, who's the head of futures trading at Equity Group. He'll be co-moderating some of the Q&A with me. Uh, Nouriel, you discussed the impact of deglobalization, fragmentation, balkanization, reshoring, uh, and, and summarize some of the negative sustained supply shocks that this will be uh, resulting in. And you alluded to the fact that that combined with uh, a monetization of fiscal deficits that at an unprecedented level, what you've referred to sometimes as MMT through the back door, coordination of monetary and fiscal policy being a kind of hel uh, effectively a, a helicopter drop um, this could lead to a risk of stagflation even after the recovery. Um, and that is something that uh, certainly brings those, of, those, those who remember the uh, period of stagflation in the 1970s, uh, certainly some, some pause. Now, uh, this is now further underlined, um, and this is a question, one of the questions that's come in from, from Ajit um, with the recent announcement by uh, Jerome Powell of the Fed's shift in its monetary policy framework, uh, shifting to um, uh, relaxation of inflation targeting and abandoning the minimum sustainable unemployment rate uh, as, a, as a, a, a target metric. Um, how, how do you think that this, uh, do you see this as, as having further uh, potential risks for this stagflation uh, prediction? Um, do you think that this is uh, a demonstration of the politicization, politicization of central banks? And do you think that other central banks, such as the ECB, will be forced to follow the Fed's move? Well, certainly the Fed was already very accommodative, as we know zero policy rates, uh, quantitative easing, credit easing, purchasing bonds, uh, uh, backstopping not just banks, but non-banks, money markets, uh, broker dealers, and even, uh, uh, you know, some of the other uh, pieces of the financial system. Now, the new flexible average inflation targeting implies that the Fed is gonna become even more easy is going to put uh, uh, his target for inflation above 2%, closer to 25 maybe 3 on a temporary basis, uh, given the new emphasis on uh, trying to avoid shortfalls of employment for maximum, is going to put greater weight on the maximum employment. And now even saying that they want uh, the maximum employment target to be inclusive, meaning you know that during a recession, uh, poor people, minorities like African-Americans, Latinos, women suffer more and therefore they want to make the economy even hotter before and the labor market hotter before they tighten rates. And therefore that's going to imply even more easy monetary policy. Now, a number of other central banks are also uh, changing formally or informally uh, reviewing their strategy. The ECB is doing its own review of the strategy. And even before that, Mario Draghi effectively had changed the target of the ECB from uh, below but close to 2% to something like symmetric around 2%, allowing essentially inflation to go above 2% on a temporary basis. Uh, the Bank of England has always had uh, a symmetric target. They can go above 2% uh, if it's temporary, even if they have to write a letter explaining why the overshot is temporary. Japan, the Bank of Japan in the last year has said, we are not going to stop QE and our easy policy until we reach inflation from above 2% and then go towards 2%. So effectively, formally or informally, many central banks are now implying their inflation target is not two, but it can be above two. Of course, achieving that uh, result is not easy unless you become very aggressive. Uh, and as I pointed out, I do not worry about inflation this year or next because we have a slack in goods market with excess capacity, slack in labor markets with a high unemployment rate, slack in commodity prices where oil and other commodities have recovered, but they're still much lower than they were a year ago, and I even slack in some real estate markets. But if you do monetize 
fiscal deficits and you have supply shocks, eventually you can have inflation or stagflation. And in the last decade before this crisis, there were two forces that were keeping uh, inflation low, uh, in spite of being at full employment in the US, in uh, Japan, in Europe, in other advanced economies. One force was still globalization that was keeping inflation low, and the other one was technological innovation that also was keeping inflation low. Now we know that we are at peak globalization and there will be a process of deglobalization. The only question is how much, how fast, how soon, how much decoupling. And even on tech innovation, I think that the decoupling between US and China on tech is going to imply less technological innovation. And I'll give you the following example. Uh, suppose that the US and Europe and its allies are going to decide not to use the 5G of Huawei because allegedly that has a backdoor to the Chinese government there's a spying. Then you're going to have to build your 5G system using the one say of Ericsson and Nokia. Those systems cost 30% uh, more than the Chinese one and they're 30% less productive and efficient. So to build the same 5G system is going to cost you in US and the West, uh, say 50% more. That means again, is a negative supply shock. So both uh, deglobalization and the uh, decoupling on the tech between US and China may imply that uh, potential growth is lower, cost of producing goods and services is going to be higher, and these are negative supply shock. Then you add the fuel of monetized fiscal deficits, eventually the inflation genie could get out of the bottle. And as we know, gold prices and now even inflation expectation in the US are starting to signal that some investors in the market are starting to worry about inflation and stagflation. It's not the story for 2020 or 21, but it could become a story for 2022. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Rubini. Uh, just a big thank you to Iskander, Zachary, and everyone at AIM for putting this wonderful quorum together. To all our guests, welcome. On behalf of Equity, we're very happy you could join us today. Um, I just wanted to say I feel very honored and privileged to be joined by a fellow NYU uh, economics alumni. Honestly, 16 years ago, as a fresh graduate, I would have uh, never imagined sharing the floor with you, Mr. Rubini. Thank you so much for your very, very insightful uh, presentation. Um, if I can ask you, Mr. Rubini, we've had a couple of questions come in um, regarding your views on the U.S. dollar uh, for the next two or th three years. Bosworth also asks uh, what your views are. Of course, you've spoken extensively about uh, um, record unprecedented federal easing. Um, global central banks are soon expected to follow. However, we will be coming to a period in time where, we will, where the Fed will be in a position to look at uh, perhaps raising base rates and also deploying quantitative tightening. This could potentially see, of course, a run on the US dollar uh, by global, um, global borrowers who need to make and finance their, um, their US dollar debt. So could you please just give us a, a brief overview of what you see for the US dollar? Well, the US dollar uh, uh, initially during the peak of the crisis, of course, uh, in February and March uh, rallied because whenever there is a risk off, uh, people go to the safety of the dollar, uh, but then since then has weakened uh, in the last two or three months uh, on a trade weighted basis about uh, 10%. The reason why it has weakened are several. One, the Fed has very easy monetary policy. You could say other central banks are also having very easy monetary policy, but I would say at the margin, the Fed is more aggressive than the ECB, BOJ, BOE and others and it's monetizing more larger fiscal deficits than other countries are doing. And now the Fed is also moving to this flexible version of average inflation targeting that implies it's going to continue to QE and it's going to normalize uh, later. Uh, financial markets actually are currently pricing in that the Fed may not even uh, start normalizing policy rates above zero before 2025 if not 2026. And uh, Jeremy, Jay Powell, chairman of the Fed, as himself said, the Fed is not even thinking about thinking 
about thinking about starting to raise rates. So the Fed remains very easy. The dollar had appreciated a lot between 2011 and 2010, almost 30% in real terms. So it was overvalued. The US also had very large uh, twin current account and fiscal deficits. The US runs a large current account deficit while Europe and Japan run a surplus. And over time, the larger US fiscal deficit is gonna make this current account deficit even larger. And the latest number just came out have shown that actually the US trade deficit is becoming bigger. Uh, you know, until the Fed was raising rates, you could finance these large twin deficits with a stronger dollar. But once you cut rates to zero and you do QE, then the force that was keeping the dollar stronger in spite of twin fiscal current account deficit goes away. There are also geopolitical factors that are bearing on the US dollar. Uh, a number of countries are worried that the US is weaponizing the US dollar. It might seize their assets, if not default on them. Uh, it's a risk that has been directly already faced, of course, by Iran or Korea, but now the Chinese or the Russian are worried also about that. And some people in Congress say we should punish China by freezing their holdings of reserves. So China is gradually deciding to reduce their holdings of dollar assets and are going and not into other currencies or in their own one because it would appreciate their currency, they're going into gold. So this weaponization of the US dollar gradually is gonna imply that other countries may want to reduce their holdings of dollar. And of course, until recently, we were in risk on rather than risk off. And when risk is on, people tend to move away from dollar into other assets, including even the currencies of some of these emerging markets that they've been strengthening. And of course, in March and February, we had a massive amount of dollar illiquidity, but given the QE of the Fed, given the swap lines with central banks, both in advanced economies and emerging markets, and even some repo lines with some emerging markets, that risk of dollar illiquidity that was leading people to try to hedge their dollar debts is now reduced and emerging markets are improving uh, and, and therefore that has been uh, uh, weakening the dollar. Of course, if this correction in equity market were to occur, if we're gonna go back to another period of uh, risk off, if we're gonna have a slowdown of growth, if we're gonna have a second wave, then if we're gonna go back to uh, risk off rather than risk on, then people may seek the safety of the US dollar in spite of these uh, fundamentals that are bearing down on the dollar. But on a medium term basis, I would say the dollar can weaken gradually. Some people say uh, the US dollar is done, is gonna lose its role as the major reserve currency. The problem is that you cannot uh, substitute something with nothing and there is not a clear alternative to US dollar. Uh, what could be the alternative, the Euro, the yen, the pound, gold, unlikely, cryptocurrencies, even less likely, uh, the RMB maybe in the very long term, but not in the short run. So there may be an unhappiness with the US dollar, but I don't see yet the collapse of the US dollar as a major global reserve currency, but I can see a gradual weakening of the dollar over time. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rubini. So, um, yeah, we're, we're getting a lot of questions. I mean, you, you referred to the stagflation in the 1970s, and uh, that was um, met with a period when we had oil price shocks uh, that uh, also influenced the, the markets. Now, in this situation, we have seen a very, very subdued demand for oil and oil prices. That also has implications on the Middle East. Uh, so we've had several questions from our audience about your views on oil prices and the economies of the Middle East, uh, how they've been affected in this crisis and how they may be affected afterwards. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, for a let me close the window here. Um, of course, for a while in the depth of the crisis, there was a collapse in oil prices for two reasons. Uh, one was this kind of a supply war between Russia and Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries. But more important even that that supply uh, war 
there was a collapse of demand, both of transportation, auto vehicles, but also of uh, jet fuel because of the collapse of, uh, you know, airlines and so on. Since then, uh, there has been a recovery of all prices. Uh, there was a day in which, as you remember, one of the contracts, actually the price uh, for the WTI even went uh, negative. Uh, all prices have gone back to the 30s and the 40s. They're not back to what they used to be in the 70s or 70s, the way they were, uh, say, in the fall uh, of last year. Uh, why that's the case has been a recovery. Uh, we have the end of this global recession and we have the beginning of a tentative recovery. Uh, the recovery has been stronger in China. Uh, many people actually find safer to drive cars rather than using uh, mass transportation. But of course, uh, the recovery is still tentative. It might be a U rather than a V and there has been a softening of growth. And, uh, and in the case of jet fuel, of course, uh, uh, aviation is recovering very, very slowly, uh, both for tourism and for business and other activity. And therefore the demand for jet fuel remains uh, limited. Uh, in addition to these cyclical factors, I think that most uh, producers of oil, uh, starting with those in the Gulf, are realizing there are some structural forces that may limit uh, how much uh, uh, demand for oil is going to rise even in the medium term and prices are going to rise. We may be the, at the point of peak demand for oil in the next 10 to 20 years because gradually we're going to move to more electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Uh, there is, of course, uh, these ESG pressures to try to reduce uh, use of fossil fuels. Uh, there is now many alternatives to fossil fuels that are becoming competitive and cost effective, whether it's solar energy, wind, uh, and other types of alternative to fossil fuels. And of course, within fossil fuels, there has been a sharp increase in production of uh, shale, gas, and oil that is also bearing on oil prices. And, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the supply is going to remain high while demand for a number of structural factors might gradually fall. And therefore, over the medium term, probably demand for oil is going to be soft relative to supply, and that's going to be a downside uh, to prices. That's why I think whether it's Saudi Arabia, of course the Emirates and everybody else in the Gulf, but also in other at all exporting countries realize that your economic strategy has to be one in which you have to gradually diversify away from relying on oil for GDP growth, for revenues, for your external balances, for building up assets and so on and you need the reorientation of the economy and diversification. Of course, there are some success stories already in the Gulf, like uh, the examples of Dubai, uh, and there are a variety of uh, plans, uh, Vision uh, 2030 in Saudi Arabia and similar ones in many of uh, creating an economy that is based more on manufacturing, based on services and advanced services. And of course, you have to educate workers provide them with skills, retraining, education, to have that transformation. But I think that there is a consensus that that diversification away from oil and fossil fuels should be occurring in the next decade. And there is a lot of very good economic plans to go in that direction. Of course, the devil is in the detail and these plans will have to be forcefully implemented over time to make sure that that diversification occurs. Now, the country, the Gulf, have the luck that uh, they have a very large amount still of assets to their variety of sovereign wealth funds and public uh, pension funds in order to make that transition. And their stocks of public debt are still relatively low. So they have the financial resources to finance that transition. But uh, this is not, of course, the time to be complacent. Uh, you'll have to do this transition faster and sooner to make sure that that diversification and stronger economic and financial stability is going to occur in the next decade. I'm optimistic that that process is going to continue and accelerate in the right direction.
Thank you for that, Mr. Rubini. Um, if I can just move over to the Eurozone, um, a bit more topical. We had the year-on-year -year GDP figure come in, coming in at uh, just a shade under minus 15% growth for uh, the Euro area. We have a question from Raid who asks, in the Eurozone, the economy was clearly suffering even before the effects of COVID-19, uh, suffering from low inflation, high unemployment, um, and this is all on the back of very, very easy ECB monetary policy. So in your opinion, Raid asks, what more uh, can the ECB do? ECB do? Well, you know, there are some positives and some uh, negatives and downside risks for Europe and the Eurozone. Uh, in Eurozone, there has been a better control of the spread of the COVID. Uh, the ECB is still very accommodative, and as I pointed out, they can do more. Uh, the EU budget rules have been suspended, and countries are allowed to run large budget deficits. Uh, there's been less of a rise in unemployment, given there are uh, risk-sharing schemes for labor. There is now greater even fiscal risk-sharing with the new recovery fund, uh, half of which is going to be grant. Uh, there is even a possibility that you'll have a creation of a real true euro bonds down the line if the debt issued by the commission becomes permanent and that might give a greater international role for the euro and now the spreads uh, even for countries like italy and greece is very low so they're not at risk of a debt crisis in the short run of course as you pointed out the economic crisis is very severe uh, growth negative uh, this year probably minus 10 uh, the cases are rising in some parts of Europe as reopen has been too soon. Uh, potential growth remains low. Uh, structural reforms are still slow. Uh, debt ratios are high, especially in parts of the periphery. And the debt dynamic over time may not be sustainable. And uh, Europe lags uh, behind US and China in big tech and the industries of the future. And the euro actually to become too strong and that could hurt uh, the competitiveness of the eurozone. Brexit could become hard and unemployment rate may be rising if the recovery is weak and the firms cannot keep on retaining those workers. And this recovery fund is not the true fiscal risk sharing, is not the true fiscal union. And there are also political risk. Now, the ECB has done a lot. Uh, quantitative easing, credit easing, even more negative policy rates, uh, commitment to a forward guidance of staying uh, at zero or negative rates for longer. Uh, the current PP program is going to run out of uh, quantitative easing by the middle of next year, has been already extended. But my view is that uh, the ECB will have to continue this program of quantitative easing beyond uh, the middle of next year. It's going to still provide uh, liquidity to solvent but illiquid firms and parts of the business sector and support uh, incentivating banks to provide loans of, uh, to the private sector. And of course, policy rates are very negative. I don't think they become much more negative than are right now. And uh, there may even be some pressure, given what the Fed has done for the ECB to formally, once they do the review of their strategy on inflation, to take a more formal a symmetric approach to their inflation target and allow some overshooting of inflation above 2%. Now, the ECB, and compared to the Fed, there's only a single mandate, price stability rather than dual mandate. It would be nice if the ECB were to move to a dual mandate where they care about unemployment. They do not care about it directly, but of course, if inflation stays low, stays low because there is slacking goods and labor market and therefore they have to maintain that easy policy easier for longer and therefore they do indirectly care about growth and unemployment so i do expect that the ecb especially what the, given what the fed does is going to be in a very aggressively accommodative position for longer and that's going to be at the margin supportive of growth of course you need fiscal stimulus you also need structural reforms in europe to sustain the economic recovery. Nouriel, this has been such an insightful session. I hope you don't mind if we go a little bit over time. There are so many questions that are coming in. Um, they're just pouring in. So if you don't mind, uh, if we go a few, few minutes extra, thank you so much. Uh, so one of the, the uh, many of us in this audience are investors, managing family offices, managing funds, uh, managing sovereign wealth funds. Uh, I recognize some of the names in this group. 
Um, and, and we're all concerned about how this uh, you know, plays out and, and how this might affect our, our portfolio. Now, um, one of the things that uh, you, you've, you've highlighted is the uh, potential risk of stagflation uh, in the years to come, um, you know, certainly not in 20 and 21 when we have this, uh, when we have this slack, but uh, potentially in the, in the years after. Uh, we've seen this uh, potentially start to play out in gold prices, in uh, inflation-linked instruments. Um, as investors, how can we think about the effect of a stagflationary environment should it come in our portfolios? What, how, how will markets react? What, asset prices, uh, what assets might uh, react positively? Which might uh, be um, reacting more negatively? Um, uh, what, what does this mean for our portfolios? Uh, should, we, uh, should we believe that this is a, a thesis that we at the very least need to hedge ourselves against? Yes, you know, of course, uh, it might be good to start to hedge uh, moderately against that risk uh, before that risk is high, but moderately that may imply, of course, uh, to be slightly, you know, overweight, uh, for example, gold. Uh, you know, in the past, actually, some commodity, even oil, has been a good hedge against uh, inflationary risk. As you pointed out, there are some uh, inflation index instruments on the fixed income side, uh, uh, tips in US and similar instruments in other advanced economies and emerging markets that could be a kind of a good edge. Now, if, uh, if uh, inflation were to rise and inflation expectation were to rise, what happens to various asset classes depends also on the policy response. Uh, there are two potential policy responses. One policy response is that uh, uh, Fed and other central bank uh, say, uh, if I tighten monetary policy, I'm going to kill the economic recovery, and therefore I'm not going to tighten and you're behind the curve. So the short end of the yield curve remains uh, low, but then if inflation expectation uh, remain high and rising, unless you do even more aggressive QE, long-term bond yields uh, are gonna go higher and you could have meaningful losses on holding of long-term bonds uh, at fixed interest rates, meaning those that are not inflation indexed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where then some losses may occur. If instead uh, central banks uh, were to say, uh, I'm gonna have to fight inflation by increasing nominal and real rates because otherwise inflation, inflation expectation is gonna get out of hand, then the risk is that even assets that are potentially hedged against uh, nominal rise in inflation, like say real estate or equity hedge you against uh, because they, they, they increase in value based on nominal, but if there was a tightening of monetary policy and real interest rates rise uh, as a way of really killing inflation, then one, you could slow down economic activity and that may push down uh, uh, assets that are risky like uh, real estate and equity or even uh, credit. And secondly, of course, uh, a rise in real rates is gonna be negative for a variety of such uh, risky assets, whether it's equity, or real estate or credit. And if there was a real fight of inflation with real rates rising, the gold prices that have been uh, supported by having uh, uh, very negative and falling real rates may stop going higher. So, so what happens uh, depends in part of whether the inflation genie gets out of the bottle and central banks are behind the curve and stay out uh, behind the curve or whether they realize they have to fight uh, inflation. Uh, which one of the two they do is not clear because if inflation gets out of hand, as we know, there are real costs and you may end up even with stagflation like the 70s, recession and inflation uh, because inflation expectations are higher. The problem is instead, if you start to fight inflation with the, such a large stock of private and public debt, the risk is not just of recession, but also 
of widespread bankruptcies. And some people worry that we're already reaching the point of uh, what people refer to as fiscal dominance, that the level of debt are so high that uh, during the next uh, pressures, central banks are not going to be able to raise interest rates because if they raise interest rates, not only have recession, but also massive bankruptcies. And if we're in fiscal dominance, then the solution to this rising debt may be wiping out the real value of this debt with unexpected uh, inflation. So in that situation, uh, it's ugly because them if you do and them if you don't. Uh, as I said, this is not a risk uh, for the time being, but two or three down the line, we're still having these large monetized deficits. So then we have to start to worry about these risks. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Rubini. Um, one more question, if I may, a more fantastical type of question. Of course, we've lived in an era of fiat uh, money since the early 1970s. Uh, central bank policies have embarked in massive easing measures, as we've discussed over the past 10 years, causing uh, fragility on the fiat currency system. Uh, recently, the Malaysian Prime Minister restated his desire for an international currency system based on gold, which has served as a representation of uh, other smaller Asian countries uh, and also the Islamic world. Uh, China and Russia have also uh, been making gold-friendly statements for years, and President Trump has consistently favored gold standard fans. His economic advisor, Lawrence Kudlow, VP Pence, and Trump-appointed World Bank President David Malpass have all indicated their friendliness towards this fantastical idea. What are your views on the school of thought of the world potentially, if at all possible, returning to a gold standard environment? Well, as I pointed out before, I think that uh, gold as a store of value is something that investors should consider uh, in order to uh, hedge themselves against the tail risk of some degree of debasement of fiat currency. So a slight overweight in gold uh, is something that I'm, uh, how to say, uh, how to say, I mean, in favor of. But the idea that we're going to have uh, a return to the gold standard where gold becomes essentially uh, the main uh, uh, either global currency or the anchor of a global currency with uh, people pegging to the gold price the way it was done with the gold exchange standard that existed after World War II. To my, in my view, that's a, still a very, very far-fetched uh, idea. For something to be really a currency, uh, it has to be, first of all, a unit of account uh, and therefore every price has to be set uh, in that uh, uh, currency. I don't see people starting to price every goods and service into gold. It has, has to be a single you know, numerator so that you can uh, essentially look at relative prices of all the goods and services as that unique numerator. It has to be a meaningful and widespread uh, 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 means of payment so that payments can occur with that and it has to be of course a stable uh, store of value domestic and international uh, gold is not a unit of account is not a single numerator is not uh, a means of payment neither domestically or internationally it could be a, st a, st a store of value both for central banks and private investors, but it's kind of highly volatile. You know, it went up in the decade up to 2011 significantly, then it fell almost 50%. Now it's gone up 50, 60%, but there are forces that could push it lower, even if I think it's going to be go going higher. And uh, we know the system in which things were packed to the, uh, to the gold, like the gold exchange standard, implied that central banks had no monetary autonomy and you could not monetize fiscal deficits. And it was the large budget deficit, say, of the Vietnam era that were monetized that eventually led to the collapse of the gold exchange standard between 1970 and 71. And we live in a world in which now central banks want to have independent monetary policy. We have large budget deficits they're not gonna become smaller and we have to finance them. If you don't finance them with money, 
and with that eventually we'll have debt crisis. So the political economy is run budget deficits and print money. And therefore that's incompatible with having a, either a gold standard or even a gold exchange standard where everybody is packed to the gold price because that implies no room for monetary easing and no room for fiscal easing and no room for monetizing fiscal deficit. So in this world in which everybody's doing large monetized fiscal deficit, who's gonna have the guts of then having tighter monetary and fiscal policy just to peg uh, to gold prices? And as we know, there was plenty of economic volatility, even episodes of severe deflation because gold prices depend both on demand but also on the supply of gold that can change over time. So gold as a hedge against some risk and a store of value, yes. Return to gold standard or even a gold exchange standard, uh, frankly, I think it's kind of highly unlikely. Well, thank you, Professor Rubini, and thank you so much for giving us uh, some additional time with you. This has been such an inf informative session. I hope that you all have come away with a better understanding of the short and medium term outlook for the global economy and for markets. Um, I, I, I think that uh, we covered so much ground in this session discussing uh, discussing the uh, this shape of the recovery, whether it would be V, whether it would be a U, uh, whether it would be this anemic U. Uh, we, we discussed the kind of some of the long-term implications, the medium-term implications of this monetization of fiscal deficits, uh, this coordination of monetary and fiscal policy, um, it, combined with the sustained uh, potential supply-side shocks of deglobalization, fragmentation, balkanization, reshoring, um, uh, we, we discussed some of the other risks that the uh, economy faces uh, that could, uh, again, uh, cause further, uh, further, further disruption. You discussed the fiscal drag, the, uh, the rising conflicts uh, with Russia and Iran interfering with U.S. elections, the political chaos that this election could cause uh, in the United States and globally, uh, the impact of this Cold War, in effect, that is happening between the U.S. and China. We talked about oil prices. We talked about gold prices. We talked about markets. Um, uh, Professor, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for for this uh, this informative session. I also want to again thank the team at uh, Equity uh, who made this session possible as its sponsors. Um, I think uh, Iskandar had a few more uh, comments that he just wanted to give to the audience. And then I'll be telling you about our session next week, uh, which will be following on these topics uh, as the uh, AIM webinar series continues. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Zachary. And thank you very much, Professor Rubini, for your informative and thought-provoking discussion. Um, I, I second uh, what Zachary said. We really covered a wide array of topics here, and it, it really gave us an insight into what to expect in the short, medium, and long term over the course of the next couple of years. Um, I'm sure everybody would agree that Nouriel's insights have been extremely interesting. We hope that you find them useful um, in feeding into your trading strategies coming along. Um, on, on my side, I'd like to thank Zachary for facilitating today's webinar and the AIM Summit for providing the platform, and Gaurav as well for your thoughtful questions. Um, I'd like to spend, send a special thank you to everyone who's joined the webinar and appreciate your time and, and hope uh, you enjoyed Professor Rubini's presentation. Thank you once again, and I'll pass it back to you, Zachary. Well, so several of you were asking about oil prices and how that's affecting the Middle East. Next week, we will be having a session on September 14th at 4 p.m. Gulf Standard Time, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Europe, Central European Time uh, with uh, Dr. Fabio Scaccio-Villani and uh, Bart Kornielsen. Um, they will be discussing the, this exact topic, the impact of oil prices on the GCC economy. That session will be sponsored by FactSet. I recommend you to register for that now. Thank you again to everyone so much. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm so sorry that we didn't get a chance to cover them all, um, but these were some of the best questions that I've seen in the webinar. And it was certainly the most enjoyable webinar that I've had the pleasure of being part of uh, since, this, uh, um, since this crisis began. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Rubini. Thank you, Professor, so much for your time. Um, this, is, this has really been brilliant. And I'm certainly looking forward to uh, a new copy of my book to, to, to repair the one that's 
been uh, sitting on my shelf for, for so many years and giving me so much uh, guidance uh, over that time. Thank you again so much. Thanks to all of you. Great pleasure and honor. And I hope the next time I can come and visit the region and I come to the Gulf uh, several times a year, usually, hopefully we'll find a way of controlling contagion. I'll, next time we see each other in person. It'd be a great pleasure and honor. Thank you again.